All right, guys. So, if you have uh, your Bible, you'd pull it out or your uh, smartphone with a Bible app. And there is a page inside your bulletin called Sermon Notes. And it's titled, The Joy of Following Jesus, Part 2. We um, started last week, actually been talking about what it means to follow Jesus for the past uh, six weeks or so, at least of my own um, speaking here. And I wanted to revisit the joy of following Jesus by talking about the costs of discipleship from a different point of view than we're used to hearing, it seems to me. And that uh, is going to be the focus of this morning. But just to review, in opening up last week, I used the example of a pilot that was practicing high-speed maneuvers and a jet fighter, and when she turned the controls for what she thought was a steep ascent, flew straight into the ground because she was unaware that she'd been flying upside down. And just the whole um, culture, uh, the the way of the world, for the most part, is uh, is we're flying upside down and don't realize it. And uh, and Jesus came to flip things back uh, right side up and to say, living... Living this way is the way that God intended our lives to be lived. And if we live right-side-up lives, we'll experience a right-side-up life. Does that make sense? Um, We won't be crashing and burning as often. Although we will go through um, difficulty, we'll have the wisdom and the confidence and the competence to deal with trials, to deal with painful situations and to deal with them well and to thrive through them. And that is, that is uh, Jesus' promise to us as we uh, abide in him and as we follow him, as we're close to him, as our lives are caught up in his, um, he, he is with us and he will bring us safely, ultimately, um, to, to the glorious other side that he has planned for us in the future. And in the meantime, uh, we'll be able to help a lot of other people find their way to Him. Uh, because the character of our lives will be distinctive. There, we'll be different. We, you know, we, we might be a little Jesus weird, but, but it'll be okay with most people. Because they want us to be that way. They want to know that there's someone that knows the Lord. They want to know that there's someone they can go to for prayer when they're hurting. They want to know that there's someone who's got some things figured out about life and the way life actually is. So that's what the church is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about helping each other follow Jesus so that our lives, so we're walking on our feet and not our hands. So we have something to offer uh, not because we think we're better than anyone or superior to anyone, but just because Jesus has given us something wonderful and, and, and we, when we have opportunity, we'll share that. Does that make sense? So discipleship from, from, the, uh, from the outset is an invitation that Jesus offers to people to enter into the kingdom of God and to live distinctively different than they were living before. And that's the whole idea of repent. The whole idea of repent isn't to make people feel bad and feel guilty and feel like they're, they're worms and need to, you know, it, it, it come to a place of groveling over their sin and, and, and ultimately separating themselves from it, although that is a part of what it means to repent, is to separate yourself from a way that's leading to destruction, the upside downness of life, to the Lord, um, it has to do with acknowledging the opportunity that's being given to us by the invitation of Jesus to enter into the kingdom, and 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 to acknowledge that that 
that offer is so glorious that I am willing to rearrange my life in whatever ways necessary to actually enter in and to follow him. To rethink about the way I'm going and the way I'm living and then to enter into the kingdom. That's what he says. And I love Jesus. Um, I shared this last week. We're just doing a little bit of a review here. That in John 1, 4, at the outset, it says that in him, in Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men and women. Life was in Jesus. Life that made sense of human existence. That's what he came to bring. And, and to be the light of life. To deliver God's life to people like you and me. To show us the way to, um, to, to, to heal us and to actually make us whole. To the degree that we can experience wholeness in this life. And I believe also that that's the enduring secret of Jesus' relevance to people today. Because what difference would it really make if a man lived 2,000 years ago that didn't have that impact on people's lives? Very little. Most people come and go in history. But Jesus is relevant today, everywhere, all over. Billions of people follow him. Why? Because in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And uh, Jesus clearly, and more than any other, knows how to bring people like us to experience the best possible life. And that's why I love doing what I do. Probably the, the, mo the most, the, what keeps me going is Jesus. What keeps me going is knowing who he is and what he is all about. I love him. I love his mission. I love his heart. I love the way he loves people. And I marvel at the fact that he loves me all the time. It gets me up in the morning. It makes me happy when skies are gray. Oh, remember that. You'll never know, dear. How much I love you. Please don't take my Jesus away. So repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Come on in. It's right here. The kingdom right side up living is available to you. Will you come? And I love what he says about the kingdom in Romans 14, 17. Again, this is just a review for the kingdom of God. is not like, you know, it's not about eating and drinking and all this stuff. It's about the right, the righteousness and justice of God and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Wow. There's a place, there's a way that brings joy. There's, there's a way that we can tune into the power of God and the righteousness of God, not the, you know, the puritanical, moralistic kind of version, but the reality of the way things are supposed to be. That's what the kingdom is all about, he says. And he says in 1 Corinthians 4.20, For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. And as a disciple of Jesus, I am learning from Jesus how to live in the kingdom of God. That is what we're talking about when we're talking about discipleship. And this is important because our church is going through a shift right now. We're wanting to shift into um, uh, the, the making it a priority, an absolute priority to help each other really follow. Not just be a church that has services on Sunday, but, but to be committed to each other and to be committed to Jesus most of all and to help each other grow and love him more and know him better and to be involved in each other's lives to some degree. <laughs> Notice I didn't say too involved. That can be a problem too, right? But we're not involved enough, most of us. Um, and we need to be because that's the way God designed it to be, not because there's some rule or some law somewhere that says if you don't, you know. It, it's, it's because he's created us to be in fellowship together and to help each other. So 
what we're learning is we're learning from Jesus how to live in the kingdom of God within the particular areas uh, that our lives are, our actual lives, our work, our uh, where we live, where we where we play, recreate, whatever. He he's interested in in showing us how to actually live, not just indoctrinate us and give us ideas and thoughts and and uh, a, a good theology. A good theology is important because that involves knowing God. But the question is, like for instance, my role as a pastor, um, as Jesus' disciple or or someone who's learning from Jesus how to live my life, I always have before me the question, how would Jesus pastor people if he were me? How would he respond to criticism? How would he deal with people's problems? How would he deal with people who are difficult? How would he plan? How would he counsel? How would he lead? How would he deal with the various issues of my work? And and that's where we all find ourselves. My actual life is the focus of my discipleship to Christ. Um, it doesn't matter if you're in full-time Christian ministry, like I happen to be, or if you are a carpenter, or a salesperson, or a blogger, or a homemaker, or a musician, or an author. Jesus himself, if you thought about it, spent most of his life on earth as an independent contractor. That's what he did. He was a businessman. He was a builder, so to speak. I don't know what he built. People have different ideas. But, but that is amazing to think about, that most of Jesus' life was just like yours and mine. He was a, he was a citizen. He was, a, he was just, in, for the most part, a, he, was, he was just a man living his life in submission to God and learning the rhythms of the kingdom in his ordinary life before his ministry began. And some people say, wow, that, does, that's, that sounds a little bit, you know, putting Jesus a little too earthy. But Jesus was very earthy in that sense. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. And, and he didn't save us from the world, he saved us for the world. We've forgotten that part, some of us to live well in the world, to make the world around us better. Being a follower of Jesus is not just about what we don't do. Thank God, because some of us have lived lives that way and have suggested that following Jesus means you don't do this, you don't do that, you don't, you know, cuss and chew and run around with girls who do, etc. <laughs> you knew that was coming, right? I said that 140,000 times in my life. Um, so, but his character, his power as an artist, as a teacher in the kingdom, leading us into life as it should be in all these areas of human existence. This is what it means to be a disciple. If you're a doctor, it means that you're not just a doctor, but you're God's representative in the medical field. So the medical field sees what it's like when Jesus helps sick people. And if you're a teacher, you're not just supposed to be a teacher. You're God's uh, representative in the classroom. So the classroom gets to see what it's like when God teaches a lesson. Because our job is to represent Christ in, 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 in the real world. Amen? Jimmy Carter once asked, If you were accused of being a follower of Jesus Christ where you live, work, and play, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Ouch. Isn't that great? Would there be? See, not just a Christian, not just a church member, not just having a ministry, but being a disciple of Jesus. Showing people what the kingdom of God on earth looks like. We pray that way all the time. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come Thy will be done, where? On earth, as it is in heaven. Lord, bring it on earth. 
bring it on earth, bring it where I go, I ask. And it's not going to be easy. And Jesus tells us that at times it'll be like being sheep among wolves. How many of you know that doesn't sound like a party? It sounds a little bit scary to be sheep among wolves. And I thought about it, it's kind of like going to a Dodger game with a San Francisco hat on. Or going to a USC game with a UCLA jersey on. But people ought to know who we are. Not that we're purposefully trying to antagonize anybody, but there's something about the character and quality of our lives that says we're following Jesus. We're wearing his jersey. We're wearing his hat. We don't cherry pick Christianity. We are, are, are fully committed to Him. And if someone can take a stand for a team that they are for at a football or a baseball game, I think we have to be able to take a stand for Jesus Christ. And I think He expects that from us. It says if we you know if we deny him before men that's not that's not it if we confess him before men he will confess us before his father who is in heaven if we deny him before men he'll deny us before his father who is in heaven jesus said that he said that for a reason because that's what it takes to be a disciple of Christ. We can't even begin to understand what he's about and what he's trying to say unless we are devoted. And that's what he says throughout the Gospels. The teachings of Jesus in the Gospels show us how to live the life that we have been given through the time, the place, the family, the neighbors, the talents, the opportunities that are ours. And his words left to us in Scripture provide all we need in the way of the general teachings that Jesus brought to us in terms of how we ought to conduct ourselves in all of the affairs of our lives. Now, um, someone said if we put the teachings of Jesus into practice, most of the problems that trouble human life would be eliminated. I believe that with all of my heart. It's not easy to put all of Jesus' teachings into practice. But it is what he taught, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus directs his teaching toward things like hatred and anger and contempt and lust and family rejection and verbal manipulation and bullying. He addresses all of that because that's real life. And we as Jesus' disciples or apprentices are occupied positively with good in our short stay here on this planet. And not just in our own power, but in His power. So we're walking with Him. So how do I become, you know, right side up? How do I become a disciple? How do I become a follower of Christ? And this will be kind of basic to some of us. Um, not how do I become a Christian? How do I become a church member in good standing? But how do I become a disciple? Someone who is learning to be like Jesus. And that could, you could, we, could, we could define discipleship that way. It's simply being a learner. Learning from Jesus how to be more like Jesus in our own sphere of life. So, um, and I talked about last week that the first step has to do with our heart. That we are, we are people who are seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. 
Could all these things be added? We're like the people who, uh, again, he gives those parables of the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in field, which a man found and hid again, and for joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. It's that kind of attitude and that kind of heart that that we have to have in order to enter into the process of learning from Jesus. That what he wants to give us is absolutely superior to anything else that life has to offer. And I'm willing to give up everything to follow him. And it doesn't mean literally selling everything we have, but it's it's having the heart that if that were demanded from us, it's something that we would do and and we would do it with a certain sense of joy over what it was that Christ was going to bring us into. That is exactly what he's talking about. Now, these stories about the kingdom express what it is going to to take in our hearts to follow. It takes clarity about the bargain. Clarity about what he's really offering us. We're not going, oh man, following Jesus is just going to be a bummer. I'm not going to be able to party as hard. I'm not going to, you know, it, it's not that. It's, I'm willing. I see it. I understand what Jesus is leading me into. Is glorious. Is beautiful. And the businessman who found the pearl of great price was not sweating over the cost. He was gladly selling everything he had to gain the pearl. And that's what Jesus is saying. I'm offering you a pearl of great price. It is worth more than anything else on planet Earth. It is worth your entire life. And after you have given it all, you will not have given anything compared to the pearl. That's why there's such joy. He says you have to see that. In Luke 9.62, I believe it's on your outline, it says, No one who looks back after putting his hand to the plow is suited to the kingdom of God. See, no one goes in bemoaning the cost. They understand the opportunity. They don't look back and go, Oh, you know, that, that was... Look at all that I gave up. For Jesus. <laughs> Think I want to go back. Like, remember the Israelites got delivered out of Egypt and they're in the wilderness and they're like, oh man, at least we had leeks and onions in Egypt. Yeah, you forgot the whips on your back. Yeah, but those leeks. <sighs> it is, it is funny. It really is if you think about it. Now, this, this bemoaning is, is what keeps many of us from discipleship to Jesus. The idea that it'll be terribly difficult, that it'll take all the joy out of our lives. And, and this is the whole point of this passage of Scripture, which is the main one I wanted you to see and get today. And that is in Luke, the next one on your outline, Luke 14, 26 through 33. So let's look at this for a minute. It says in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate, this is, this is radical. And does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Verse 29, otherwise when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or, what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else... While the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Wow. This is, right? This has been stuff. I don't know about you guys, but when I 
started following Christ, this stuff bothered me. I mean, I thought about it a lot. What does it mean? What does this mean? How does this work? And again, I want to remind us of the basic idea here where Jesus is talking about what it means to be his disciple. Um, the Greek word, mathetes, that, you know, nobody cares what it is, but it, it means simply taught one, trained one, learner person. Um, and the entire point of the passage is that as long as one thinks that anything may really be of more value, more valuable than fellowship with Jesus in his kingdom, one cannot learn from Jesus. Does that make sense? We can't even learn from him. If we're, it won't make sense. It won't make sense what Jesus is asking from us, what he is teaching us, what he is showing us. Dallas Willard said it would be like a math teacher in high school saying, truly I say to you, except thou canst do decimals and fractions, thou canst in no wise do algebra. And he's right. You can't do algebra unless you can do decimals and fractions. You can't be Jesus' disciple unless you're, you're completely committed to him and the value of what it is that he's offering. He's not saying to literally hate your father and mother. We know that for sure. The scripture tells us to honor our father and mother. The scripture in other places tells us how important it is to love our wives as Christ loved the church for men and, and, and women to love their husbands and respect their husbands. So he can't be talking about that, but he's using language to demonstrate to us very clearly that it is this heart toward Jesus and all in, I will follow and I see the value of all that he is offering that will give me the opportunity to begin to learn from him. These are the decimals and these are the fractions. So counting the cost of discipleship is not moaning and groaning. Oh, how terrible it is. Counting the cost is to bring us to the point of clarity and decisiveness. He wants us to make a decision. It's to help us see. Counting the cost is precisely what the person, the man who pursued the pearl of great price and the hidden treasure did. They counted the cost. I counted the cost. What I have is nothing compared to what I have to gain. Does that make sense? When you are what I have is nothing compared to what I have to gain person, you have begun to be Jesus' disciple. Now, what he teaches will make sense. It's to help us see. And uh, out of their decisiveness and joy, um, those are the outcomes of counting the cost. Decisiveness. We give everything I have and the joy over receiving the kingdom. So the passage is about clarity. It's not about misery. It's not about some dreadful price to be Jesus' disciples. There is no such thing as a dreadful price. Even suffering for Jesus is actually something that we will rejoice over and to be counted worthy of. I just started reading this book that's... Uh, mind-boggling that the voice of the martyrs put out called IMN, Inspiring Stories of Christians Facing Islamic Extremists. And I wrote a little thing in an email I sent you all this week, inviting you to come this morning. But to read some of the stories about the incredible, you can't even describe some of what these believers in Jesus have experienced but how time and time again they rejoice in being counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. What produces that in the life of a person? Jesus. His kingdom. Seeing clearly. 
In Luke 14, 27, it says, Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I want to look at this again. And the, the, the point that Jesus is making is that unless we clearly see the superiority of what we receive as his followers over every other thing that might be valued, we cannot succeed in our discipleship to Jesus. We will not be able to do the things required to learn his lessons and move ever deeper into a life that is his kingdom. Now, some of this is like, woo, okay, this is wild stuff. Um, Jesus said, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And most historians and scholars believe that Jesus may be envisioning another Judas of Galilee, not one of his disciples, who gathered a small army to overthrow the Romans But the Romans defeated them and hung them on crosses all along the roads of Galilee so everybody could see. So when Jesus told his followers to take up their crosses and follow him, they knew what he meant. They knew he meant total commitment. And in fact, as you know, except for Judas and John, the other ten disciples were killed for their faith. So to be a true disciple, we must freely admit that we are followers of Jesus. And be willing to give our lives to him. The cross is an instrument of death. And it was the most vivid way that Jesus could teach us that to truly live, one must first truly die. Not physically, but in one's mind. It is to disallow oneself to be the ultimate point of reference in our world that we must not treat ourselves as God should be treated or treat ourselves as God. So when Jesus talks about dying to self or self-denial, he's not talking about religious stoicism or weirdness or denial of desire, but putting off of something lesser, of lesser value for something of the greatest value. Listen carefully. Dying to self means to die to the things and thoughts and actions that are contrary to God's quality of life. That's what he means. It means denying and forsaking anything that hinders our walk with God. Luke 14, 33 through 35 says, So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is Jesus again. So when Jesus says we must lose our lives to find them, he means very clearly and always the surrender of a lesser dying self for a greater eternal one. Amen. Last passage, Matthew 16, 24 says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So he's saying here, being a follower of Christ is a matter of how you live your life. We follow Jesus. He's our teacher. We're his student. He's the journeyman, we're his apprentices. He is the Lord, we're his servants. He is the king, we are his subjects. 
He is our leader. We are his followers. So here's what, what should we do? What are the practical steps here to bring us into a joyous vision of the kingdom? First is to ask. And I believe this is so important. The first thing is that we have to repeatedly express to Jesus our desire to see him more fully as he really is. We, we ask. We say, Jesus, show me more and more clearly what this is all about, what you're offering to me. Help my heart to be engaged and not to just think I know everything already and, and, to, and to put up barriers. Secondly, to abide in his words. Ask and abide. And again, this is going to, we should use every means possible to see Jesus more clearly. His word. John 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So he's saying, that we will be liberated from the bondage of human life as it is lived in sin, and especially from self-righteous religiosity, because Jesus hated that. Thank God he hated that. When what is dwelling or continuing in his word mean, it means that you center your life upon the teachings of Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves, am I, is, am I there? Am I seriously asking Jesus to show me himself more and more clearly? Am I making, um, am I a, making his teaching the center of my life? And lastly, decide. Because ultimately we become Jesus' disciples by deciding to follow him. We don't drift into discipleship. We only fail to be his disciples if we don't decide to be. Does that make sense? I have to make the decision. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? But because I do accept him as Lord, his instructions on how to live are my treasures. And again, I love uh, Dallas Willard on this. He said, I cannot do what Jesus said by just trying. I must train. And that's what our church is supposed to be about. To help people, to train people, to live the Jesus life. So, coming in the fall, we are going to offer a path for doing just that experiencing the life journey. To learn to love as Jesus loved and experience transformed relationships. To believe as Jesus believed and experience transformed minds. To live as Jesus lived and experience transformed character and service. And to lead as Jesus led to experience transformed influence. And we're going to spend 30 weeks as a church walking on this path together and letting God transform us from the inside out so that hopefully at the end of that process uh, we'll be a little band of crazy people running around and, and, and loving and living and learning and leading for Jesus even more than we are now. So let's, let's do that, shall we? Let's pray together. Lord, we, we long for your heart. We long for your wisdom, your ways, and Lord, your, your mission in the world to be shaped into us more and more. We pray that you would cause our church to be um, legit followers. Not perfect, but just going your way and seeing you do great things in our lives together. Thank you for the men and women and the boys and girls that are a part of this uh, expression of the body of Christ in the world. 
And we pray that, that in this coming year, uh, we'll see greater fruit than we ever have because we're following more closely than we ever have. If you're here today and, and this is, you know, you've never made that decision, you know, part of what we do, I would do this on Sunday, is to offer opportunities for people to make decisions and to to say, I really want to, I want to follow Jesus. I want to learn more. I want to, I want to give my life to him. I want to live in the kingdom, to experience eternal life, to have my sins forgiven, yes, but to also live, to live in the freedom that Jesus talked about and the abundant life that Jesus talked about and the joy and the power and for things to be right, even when they're wrong. If you're here today and you want, and, and, and you, you're, maybe there's an internal struggle going on, but you're saying, you know what, I really need to make a decision to follow him. Even if it means, you know, and that's the whole idea of repentance, where I'm, I'm just calculating this thing in my head, and I have to go to the place of making the choice. I have to get there, and I have to do so so the kingdom will will be opened up to me. Jesus said, if you confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you confess that he's Lord, he's a master. He really is. I'm the, I'm the follower. I'm, I'm his servant. I believe, Jesus, you rose from the dead. You conquered death on the cross to forgive sins and rose from the dead to give life, to give me life, to forgive my sins. I, almost everybody has to go to that point of saying, okay, I'm in. I have to, I have to make a decision to follow. If that's your decision today, tell the Lord that. Just tell him in prayer, Lord Jesus, I, I don't understand everything, but I, I want to become your follower. I want to become, I want to be saved today from my sins and I want to have everlasting life in the kingdom of God that starts now and goes on forever and ever. Come into my life, Lord. Change me from the inside out, God. Forgive me for all my sins and rebellion to you. Help me. Show me more clearly who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. And I would say one other thing. Don't leave here today if you prayed that prayer without telling someone, I prayed that prayer. You may have prayed that prayer a hundred times before, but you, you said, I prayed it again because I really want to follow Jesus. Tell someone.